When I refer to wealth, I mean much more than just money. I've met, and indeed I know some of the richest people in the world, but some of them have very little of what I'd call real wealth. Some of them are workaholics with little quality time or friends, just looking for the next million. Of course, wealth is partly about having money, but real wealth is good health. Without your health, what use is money? Real wealth to me is having good friends who you can share intimate and pleasurable experiences with, laugh with, who stimulate and fascinate you. Real wealth is feeling happy most of the time. Real wealth is a sense of knowing you're contributing something to the world, that your life is worthwhile. After all, you are unique. Nobody can do things exactly the way you do them. Everyone has special skills they bring to the world, and the fulfillment of that is a wealthy feeling. First of all, I'd like to start by dispelling some myths about money, by perhaps challenging some of your views about money. Because before you can truly become richer in the physical world, you're going to have to become richer in yourself. Stop for a moment and ask, what would having more money give you that you don't already have? Whenever I ask this question, most people have ideas come to mind like freedom, security, or power. Good news is, these are states and it's easy to create them. But wealth is relative. When some people become millionaires, 100 million then seems like a lot, and a million doesn't. People who think like this can never have enough money. In a sense, they always feel poor inside. The Indian guru Swami Muktananda, upon arriving in America, stood at the airport and said, they live in paradise, yet they'll never know it. For the next few minutes, I'm going to talk specifically about money and firstly, why some people are good at creating money and others are not. Many researchers have found the distinction is predominantly in the way that we think. I don't mean intelligence, but thought patterns. Some people have what I call a poverty consciousness. Deep down at an unconscious level, they just don't believe they're worthy of wealth. Or they fill their heads with thoughts about why they're poor, or why life isn't fair, why others have so much more than them. If you've got thought patterns like that, we're going to change them because this part of the positivity system will help you reprogram yourself so you automatically begin to think more like a millionaire. As the author James Allen says in his book, As Man Thinketh, a particular train of thought persisted in, be it good or bad, cannot fail to produce its results in the character and circumstances. A man cannot directly choose his circumstances, but he can choose his thoughts and so indirectly, yet surely, shape his circumstances. Research has shown that a massive proportion of those who suddenly get enormous sums of money, for example from lotteries or inheritance, are great at losing it all very quickly. 80% are actually worse off financially just two years later. That's because inside they still feel poor and the mind has to prove itself right. It can't deviate from its self-image. So if deep down you think of yourself as poor, or if you constantly fear poverty, that's usually what you'll get. In the words of Jim Rohn, if someone hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire or you won't get to keep the money. You need to have the self-image of someone who deserves great wealth. What we're going to do next will help you develop and install in your mind a prosperity consciousness, which is much more than attracting money. It's a change in your self-image to one of greater harmony, so you begin to notice the abundance that surrounds you, taking so much more pleasure in everything. If someone has money problems, that's usually only a symptom, but not the root cause of the problem. There's something in them that needs to change. This isn't just another get-rich-quick scheme. The positivity system helps you change your fundamental attitudes towards wealth. As the saying goes, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he eats for life. So what is money? The earliest system of trade was bartering. Eventually, coins were used to represent the value of things. They were the first IOUs. Then came paper money. A dollar bill is an IOU from the government. They used to print only as many dollar bills as they had gold reserves to support in the bank. However, in the 1940s, the governments of the world decided to abandon the gold standard system. Since then, they've been printing money like it was going out of fashion. So now there's only a fraction of gold in reserve compared to the amount of paper money in circulation. 
Even paper money is being replaced by plastic credit cards and numbers in computers. So money is essentially a symbol. Quite simply, money is a form of confidence. Say, for example, you and I are sitting here and we have one dollar bill between us and we pass it back and forth. If we do it really quickly, in a week we could spend a million dollars. Money is the oil in the machine of the economy of a nation. It allows the flow of goods and services. Another way of looking at money is as packaged experience. Your efforts and work is translated into money and it's translated back into a vacation or an automobile or whatever. However, some people view money as a commodity, wishing to acquire money for money's sake. These people often fear not having enough money, so they hoard as much as they can. This slows down the economy of a country, just as it's harder for an engine to work without enough oil. Also, these days, there are plenty of people who use money to project power, success and happiness. However, money itself is not a source of happiness. Happiness is a neurochemical event. It's a state that you generate within you. History is littered with people who found that money alone wasn't enough. Elvis Presley, Howard Hughes, Marilyn Monroe, Christine Onassis and the Gettys are all prime examples. The musician Ry Cooder said, all the money in the world is spent on feeling good. But you already know that good feelings are just states of mind and body. So part of the equation of becoming wealthier is simply to cut out the middleman and just have the good feelings that the money would have given you. Some people say, well, I can't feel self-respect or achievement until I have a certain amount of money in the bank. Of course, it's great to have targets and goals, but why don't you make one of them feeling good now? Let's talk about negative thoughts about money. Most people have been programmed with some negative financial limitations. They've been taught things like the Bible says, money is the root of all evil. What the Bible actually says is, the love of money is the root of all evil. That is the acquiring of money for its own sake. Or they've been told that there's only a finite amount of wealth and that the more you have, the less there is for others. Again, this is more garbage. It's actually common in our culture to hear terms such as filthy rich or fat cat, which are indicative of an unconscious mistrust of money. Our unconscious beliefs about money affect how much we're able to create. If, say, you believe money is bad in some way, you'll unconsciously sabotage your attempts to create more money in your life. For example, some artists believe that they cannot have commercial success because that compromises their artistic integrity. Other people believe that you can't be a good person unless you're always helping others, even if it's to your own detriment. But as Abraham Lincoln said, you can't help the poor by being one of them. Some people stay poor because it's safe. It's what they know. But it's not what they're truly capable of. Quite simply, the outside world is a manifestation of our inner world. As you use the positivity system, you're going to let go of any old limited ideas you've had about money and program your mind to become more prosperous. Limited ideas about money are historically derived. During the Middle Ages, the feudal system gave wealth to a privileged few, whilst the masses were tricked into believing that poverty was their salvation. This hierarchical system of power assumes that there's only a finite amount of wealth to go around, implying a scarcity of wealth. That is like some of the corporations of today where power is top heavy and everyone competes for their position. In some cases, poverty was glamorized and for many years it was actually considered a Christian virtue. Some people who grew up in the last century during the Depression or experienced rationing of food and essentials during the Second World War have unconscious beliefs that they just won't be enough to go round, and many of them have inadvertently passed them on to their children. One of the extremely negative attitudes about money is holding resentment towards someone else's wealth. That comes from a place of very low self-esteem, and it keeps those people stuck. It's better to wish the best for others. When it comes to money, nearly all the self-help and metaphysical books refer to something called the Law of Attraction. The law of attraction is a useful metaphor for synchronicity, which can be described as the appearance of meaningful coincidences or incidences of chance. For example, if you ever thought about someone, the phone rings and it's them. Now, is that telepathy, some kind of magnetic attraction, or just coincidence? Have you ever thought about, say, getting a particular car? Then suddenly, you see that type of car everywhere. Maybe you're just noticing how many of those cars were there already. 
wouldn't it be good to attune your mind to notice how many opportunities there are to become wealthier? Some people believe the mind is like a magnet, that what we hold uppermost in our attention, we attract to us. In other words, we always get more of what we focus on. In music, there's something called the principle of sympathetic resonance. If you have two pianos in the same room and you hit a C note on one piano, you'll find that the C string on the other piano will start vibrating in resonance at the same rate. The same way you're always attracting people and circumstances that resonate with your predominant thoughts. Whether you choose to believe in the law of attraction or not, it's interesting to note that many highly successful people do. Those who focus on the positive in life and attract it to them are called lucky. I personally believe we create our own luck. That is what's meant when it says in the Bible, a man is what he thinks about all day long. Your thoughts are an energy that are powerful and creative. I found that most wealthy and successful people tend to employ the same simple habits and beliefs about prosperity. However, the same rule of habits and beliefs applies to poverty as well. I believe that many people help to keep themselves poor through the beliefs and habits they have towards money. They use the evidence that their lack of money has made them poor. Whereas sometimes their poor behaviors in relation to money is what keeps them from experiencing abundance. They've affirmed over and over again, often unconsciously, that they're poor, so it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy, a poverty consciousness. What the positivity system does is helps you to change that. I'd like to share with you some techniques that I've used myself that have helped me dramatically increase my personal wealth. I've taught them to others, they've also increased their wealth, and now I'd like to share them with you. One of the first things that made a major difference for me was consciously deciding to do things differently. Years ago, I definitely had a poverty consciousness, worrying constantly about being poor or how not to be poor. So guess what? My attention was, yes, on poverty. For example, when a bill would come through the mail, I'd open it, I'd worry about how I was going to pay it, I'd feel poor inside. Obviously, it's important to be financially organized and consider how best to pay bills. However, I was also affirming to my unconscious mind a poverty belief. If you're going to be wealthy, it's just as important to prepare for wealth by feeling rich inside. So what I started to do when I opened the bill was vividly imagine I had thousands in the bank. You can imagine how good that feels. I was sending a new message to my unconscious. Some people try saying affirmations like, I am truly wealthy. But if deep down you don't believe that, it's next to useless. You have to create a feeling of wealth by vividly imagining yourself as wealthy over and over again. Next, I needed to change my self-image around money. I had a scruffy little checkbook, one that reflected my scruffy little finances at the time. So I changed banks and got a clean new one to help me start to feel different. The mind is sensitive, so it's important to signal to yourself that positive changes are happening. Then the real fun began. I needed to get a strong sense of what greater wealth would be like. So I got an old bank statement, cut it up, removing the bits that said overdrawn, and began to rearrange the figures and glued it back together, showing that I had thousands in credit. As soon as I'd finished, I burst out laughing. Actually holding it in my hands, it began to feel more real. Within a few months, the imaginary amount had become a reality. Having that tangible piece of paper, the bank statement, had really helped. So I went about making a scrapbook, collecting pictures of things I wanted, places I wanted to visit, people I wanted to meet. Remember, the mind needs a sensory-rich experience of what you want, what you wanted to make real for you. It's important to have big dreams so you can grow into them. For example, a few years ago, I went into a Mercedes showroom sat in a car to get comfortable, smelled the leather, went for a test drive, imagined vividly it was my own, took away a brochure and added it to my scrapbook, imagined driving it every day. Pretty soon, I started to see Mercedes everywhere. My mind was now focused on getting me one, and chance favors the prepared mind. So it wasn't long before a bargain came along, and I bought my first Mercedes. As George Bernard Shaw said, some men see things and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask, why not? A friend of mine got really into this type of creative visualization. He'd been practicing on visualizing parking spaces. Amazingly, it seemed to work. 
so he decided to go for bigger things. He'd never travelled abroad, and he really wanted to, but he didn't have the finances. So he collected together a bunch of travel brochures, cut out the pictures of all the places he wanted to go, and stuck them in his scrapbook. This is the funny part. He packed his suitcase every Sunday for a month and went to the airport. He even stood in line. He'd then come home and watch a video of a program about travelling on Concorde and look through his scrapbook at all the places he wanted to go. He really gave himself, his unconscious mind, that experience of travelling to and enjoying exotic locations. He focused on it for a month non-stop because he believed you always get more of what you focus on. Suddenly, he was called into his boss's office and asked if he would become their international correspondent. His boss explained it would mean travelling all over the world. He could hardly believe it. Most amazingly of all, when he arrived in a small village in Switzerland, he began to get a feeling of deja vu. It was only when he got back to England and checked in his scrapbook that he found it was the exact same village that he'd been visualising. Extraordinary as it may seem, I've witnessed many such occurrences similar to this since. I personally have become more sceptical about coincidences and am willing to consider that in some cases it's as though the mind may actually have the ability to attract events, things or people to us. When I made a TV series about paranormal phenomena, we featured one experiment conducted by a French scientist. He created a robot that moved in a random pattern around the room. Then, he hatched a group of chicks. When a chick's born, the first thing it sees it believes to be its mother. This process is called imprinting. The chicks imprinted on the robot as their mother. Then, he put the chicks in a cage in one corner of the room and switched the robot on. Amazingly, it stopped moving randomly around the room and moved over to the area where the chicks were. There it stayed, moving back and forth strong evidence for the existence of what's known as psychokinesis, or in other words, mind over matter. It appeared that the chicks were somehow willing the robot that they believed to be their mother to stay with them. At Princeton University, hundreds of thousands of experiments have been conducted testing human ability to influence machines and physical matter. When I made my TV program about paranormal phenomena, I interviewed Dr. Michael Iverson from Princeton University, who'd been conducting a number of experiments which strongly point to the existence of psychokinesis. Some people are better at it than others, but it's like anything. The more you practice it, the better at it you get. I began to wonder, could it really be possible to literally attract money? What is interesting is that many rich people believe that's how they do it. But how do you do it? It's very simple, but it does take regular practice. You're going to need to rehearse being wealthy, like a method actor would play a part and do it over and over again. Totally get into that part. Okay, the first thing you need to do is get a scrapbook and start collecting pictures of things that you want, people you'd like to meet, places you'd like to go, things that you really want, anything that you want to bring into your life. Incidentally, it can just be a symbol you desire. Then, go about creating sensory-rich experiences of your goals. If it's a particular car, go about getting a test ride. Then it'll be easier to vividly imagine driving one over and over again. If it's a beautiful house, imagine walking around it until you know every inch of it. The feeling of the carpet, the smell, the texture of the furniture, and so on. Also, be open to feedback from your unconscious mind. When I first imagined owning a Bentley, I was visualizing driving it down the road but other cars kept bashing into me, no matter how hard I kept trying to get out of the way. I took this to be a warning that, although I could get a Bentley, the cost at the time might be some jealousy. In other words, there was a cost greater than money than I'd foreseen. The next step is, every day, look at your scrapbook. Imagine what it would be like living your desire. See what you'll see, hear what you'll hear, and feel how good it'll feel. Do it as often as you can every day. You may not get instant results. You can imagine how chaotic the world would be if every whim or fancy we ever had suddenly materialized, but you will begin to set the process in action. Okay, I'd like you to stop for a moment and imagine how your life would be different if you are much wealthier. How will you walk? How will you talk? How will you feel? How will others treat you? How will you feel about paying bills? What kind of luxuries will you have? 
What will you buy? How will it feel better to be earning more money? Think about this every day until you become very comfortable and used to it. Right, next, here are the 20 best ideas that I can give you on how to start increasing your wealth today. Any one of these will make a difference. As you start using more and more of them, you'll move even faster towards a wealthier life, towards the millionaire's mind. Number one, save first, then spend what you can truly afford. Now, I know this sounds obvious, but poor people do the opposite. They spend what they earn. Often, they spend more than that and wind up affirming their poverty. You have to have a plan and stick to it. Come up with a plan to clear any outstanding debts and take steps towards reducing your debt month by month. As soon as possible, stop keeping your head above water and start laying the foundations of wealth. Some people find it helpful to write down everything they spend money on. Somehow, having it right there in front of them makes it much clearer. Two, study wealthy people. Find out what it is that they're doing and you aren't. Understand how they think and behave towards money and wealth. Do the technique we did where you choose a role model. Ask yourself, what did they do that I don't do yet? Read books and listen to audio programs on wealth. There's plenty of superb sources of wisdom on the bookshelves. Three, ask for help. I find that as long as you're polite and respectful, most people are willing to help. There are other reasons why asking is a good practice. It makes other people aware of who you are and lets them know you take yourself seriously. It's a sign of self-worth. It also gives others the pleasure of helping you. Not everyone will offer to help because they don't want to impose. So ask and give them the opportunity and the pleasure of helping. It's good for their self-worth as well. As Charles Givens, the author of Wealth Without Risk says, if you want to learn about money, learn from somebody who has a lot of it. Many of the most successful people I know have said that they wish more people would have the courage to ask them for advice. Or, regular visualizations. Create a sensory rich experience of what it is that you want so your unconscious mind can get a clear idea. Also, walk around for an hour each day imagining you have everything you want. Walk into a restaurant as though you are a multi-millionaire or a famous rock star or whatever it is that turns you on. Do it like a method actor would totally get into the path because it conditions your mind to get used to success and it's a lot of fun. Five. Make a joy list. Think of everything you love doing. Then, regularly treat yourself. Let yourself know that you really care about yourself. How do you expect other people to treat you if you don't occasionally treat yourself? Six, continually stretch yourself. Dare to dream and think big. Push the limits. I don't mean take unnecessary risks, but most achievement involves some leaps of faith. You can either choose a life of getting by and surviving, or you can push the boundaries. That's how human beings grow, by stretching. As the saying goes, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll just get more of what you've already got. Highly successful people are continually stretching themselves. Stretching means moving out of the comfort zone. It's easy to become complacent and get stuck. However, if you continually look for bigger challenges, then you continually grow. It's important to have big dreams so you can grow into them. As Donald Trump says, you have thousands of thoughts every day, you might as well make them big ones. Seven, get comfortable with money. Carry an appropriate amount of money. Get used to having it on you. Get comfortable with it. This sends an important message to yourself. One technique I used was to practice writing out checks and paying in slips for millions of dollars until I felt comfortable doing it. Obviously, don't leave them lying around. Doing that process meant that I was able to feel comfortable paying out large sums of money and to paying in large sums of money. So I conditioned myself to become a wealthier person. Far too many people are scared by large sums of money. When you get more money, your financial pressures don't get smaller, they get bigger. But that's the fun of it, because you become a more capable person. You have to be prepared to accept the responsibility. Be ready to play the bigger game. The bigger the challenges, the bigger the rewards. Like mastering any new skill, you do it one step at a time, rehearse success over and over again, and then have it happen in the real world. Imagine what it's gonna be like to be wealthier, so when it happens, it's not overwhelming. It's a pleasure. Number eight, always give more than you're paid for. That way, other people will have a feeling of value towards you. 
it was only as long ago as the 60s that Japanese products were generally considered cheap and tacky. The legendary corporate consultant Edwards Deming largely helped in changing that. He developed a strategy that was adopted by the Japanese that focused upon two simple but important ideas, quality control and constant improvement. Nowadays, Japan is a nation of industrial might. By changing their beliefs about what was important, they became wealthy and powerful. It's easy. Just ask yourself, how can I do it better next time? Constantly look for ways to improve. Number nine, an attitude of gratitude. Now, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it really works. An attitude of gratitude is the exact opposite of a poverty consciousness. When you start to regularly think of all the good things you have, of how fortunate you are, that sends a strong message of abundance to your unconscious mind and creates a flow of prosperity. One of the single most important things you can do is make a practice every night before you go to sleep of thinking through all the good things in your life. Your health, your friends, your opportunities, where you live in the world and so on. And say thank you to God, to life, the universe, whatever it is that you feel most comfortable doing. A friend of mine has a great saying along these lines. Today's gratitude buys you tomorrow's happiness. Of course, this also applies to people. Others love genuine gratitude and it encourages them to help you again and again in the future. Number 10, stop seeing poverty as a problem and treat it as a challenge. Most wealthy people have to overcome it at some time in their lives. You don't have to make millions overnight. Just start making a bit more and more each day. Number 11, watch out for those old patterns of affirming poverty. For example, don't steal paper clips from the office. Anyone who's truly wealthy wouldn't need to. Feel good about paying bills. They're from people who believe that you can pay. They're more symbols or affirmations of wealth. Number 12. Stop wasting time on unimportant things. Figure out what's most important to you and prioritize your life accordingly. I used to get caught with this one. Let's say your time's worth $100 an hour. Spending two hours calling around trying to get a lower price on something of $50 is bad money and time management. Number 13. Write down good ideas as soon as they come to you. Very few people actually bother to do this. Keep a pen and paper handy or a pocket tape recorder. That way you won't be discarding your genius. Sometimes one idea could make you a million dollars. For example, if you ever had an idea for a product or service a few months later, you see it being marketed by someone else. What's the difference between you and them? They took action. They made a note of their idea and then they went out and did something about it. 14. Regularly practice the positivity techniques. For most people, opportunities to become wealthier present themselves every day without being leapt upon or even noticed. By practicing the techniques again and again, you're conditioning yourself to focus on wealth. Financial success is simply a matter of holding certain beliefs and religiously practicing certain actions consistently. Very few multimillionaires get to be rich by accident. They do it by certain ways of thinking and behaving in the world. Now it's your turn. 15. Make sure you pay yourself. Now, this may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people pay everyone else and don't get around to paying themselves. They fear there won't be enough to go around, and by leaving themselves to last, there isn't. In fact, you could even go one step further and pay yourself first. Every month, write yourself a check. That way, you'll unconsciously adjust your spending and make different choices so that there's some money left for you. 16. Know your weaknesses. Everybody knows what they're good at, but not everyone's good at admitting their limitations. A friend of mine's father suffered from this. He was a highly creative man, but not a skilled businessman. He made a lot of money from his creative work, lost nearly all of it through bad business deals. He loved the business he was in, but overstretched himself, thinking he could do everything. As my friend said on the matter a few years later, just because you like food doesn't mean you should be running a restaurant. There's some things I'm not good at, so I can either spend time and effort mastering them or hire someone else to do them. Number 17, get in touch with your passion every day. I remember years ago when I first got interested in hypnosis, one of the old stage performers I was learning from was a salesman. He couldn't go for long without selling something to someone. We'd be out and he'd strike up a conversation with a person on another table. He'd find out their needs and offer to sell them what it was that they wanted. Often, he didn't even have it. 
He'd then have to go and acquire it himself. He loved the thrill of persuading someone else. One day, he knocked on my door and asked me to drive him home. I inquired where his Rolls Royce was. He explained that earlier he'd been in the bank, he got carried away and sold it to someone. When I asked him what he thought his secret was, he said, excitement and passion are contagious. When you get truly passionate about what you want to do, others will find themselves drawn to you. If you want to know more about this kind of thinking, I recommend you read Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow by Marsha Sunita. 18. Take the fear out of making money. This is a concept running throughout Dr. Richard Carlson's book, Don't Worry, Make Money. He's got some very empowering ideas. For example, stock away a large pile of money, if you can, a year of living expenses. It may involve some self-discipline, but it'll give you a massive psychological safety net. He tells the story of two men who were both offered the same job with a startup computer company in the 70s. The offer was for very low pay, but with a large piece of stock. The man who was living paycheck to paycheck thought it was too risky in past. The one who put away some savings took the offer, needless to say, within a few years he'd amassed a huge fortune. The moral of the story is that in most cases, creating abundance usually involves some risk. As the saying goes, risk is the currency of the gods. Richard Carson also uses another example of how taking the fear out of money helps when he says, be prepared to walk away from a negotiation. You can usually go back. When you're not attached to an outcome, you're more powerful. Other people unconsciously pick this up from you. He uses an example where, say you find a house you love, the asking price is $100,000. You know it's not worth any more than $90,000. If you're willing to walk away and not to worry about it, more often than not, the seller will come back to you because most other people are worriers. He won't want to turn down a certain thing, your offer, for an uncertain thing. He'll probably make you a counter offer, but when he senses you're not a worrier and happy to walk away, it'll be far lower than if he sensed you had fear. Number 19, charge what you're truly worth. There's an old story about the King's steamship. When it broke down, every engineer in the land was summoned to try and fix it, but all of them failed. Then, one little old man said that he could do it, but he wanted $300. The king agreed, and the little man took out a tiny screwdriver, turned one screw, and the steam engine began working perfectly. $300, please, said the little old man. The king, looking rather dismayed, exclaimed, $300 for turning one screw? No, replied the little man. One dollar for turning the screw, 299 for knowing which screw to turn. Some people are frightened to charge what they're really worth because they fear they won't be in demand. But this strategy can keep you falsely overworked rather than giving you more money for doing less and having more time to concentrate on other ways to create abundance. Remember to reevaluate from time to time your real worth. And finally, number 20, keep going. Every successful person at some stage has to go through the frustration barrier. Colonel Sanders, who started Kentucky Fried Chicken, is a famous example. When he reached retirement age, he looked at his social security check and thought, I need to make some more money. So he sat down and thought through what his resources were, and he remembered that everyone loved his chicken recipe. So he went to a local restaurant and explained that he had a great recipe, he didn't want to sell it to them, all he wanted was a royalty each time they used it. Of course, they weren't interested. So he went to another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. A thousand and nine rejections later, he got his first acceptance. I've seen far too many people fail just because they didn't hang in there. Very few people get successful without effort and persistence. Finally, I want you to remember that true wealth is not measured by money alone. Start today. Take stock of your true wealth. Create a plan and start moving towards it. Make the changes that you need to make. After you've begun to enjoy more of the success that you desire, you'll look back and be thankful that you did.